And we are back in the studio, Cyber Hub Engage. James Azar here, your loyal host. I'm with our my, my really good friend, my steak and wine buddy, Nir Vaultman. Hey, Nir. Hey, how's it going? I'm living the dream, man. I am living the dream. So Nir and I have been in the studio for about, I think, an hour and a half. Um, we've been recording our episodes in Hebrew. Um, if you don't understand Hebrew, I'm sorry. But if you do understand Hebrew, we do uh, a series in Hebrew together. I'm um, talking about some of the things in cyber. And we were we got into this whole discussion earlier where we completely, instead of talking about you know really important stuff, ended up talking about how I think the cybersecurity market's going to consolidate in the next three to five years. And Nir didn't really agree with me. But it's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. Yeah, we usually need to agree on disagreeing, and that's it. Well, we need to agree on the fact that we both enjoy steak and wine, yep. and then everything else from there can be fine. But I wanted to talk to you about open source. And um, this is what I like to call a power cyber hub engage episode. So this isn't going to be usual length. Uh, we are going to stay very topic specific, talking about open source. More and more companies use open source. More and more challenges come up with open source tools that are out there, especially security tools. You're a CISO. How scary is open source to you? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Loaded question, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, um, so, yeah, so let's break it down. Yeah. So open source challenges. Yeah, I think the the main challenges with open source is one that you really need to know what you use, um, and the reason why you need to what you know what you use eventually is because uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities that come with third party libraries, but not only third party libraries. What happens with fourth party and fifth party and you know nth party? The thing is that even open source libraries have other open source libraries that they nest or they include, right? It's an endless cycle. It's an endless cycle. So eventually, when you try to understand uh, what you actually use in a product, you usually look at the third-party product, but you, you really need to look at what are the additional dependencies that each product has, right? Right. This is one thing. The other concern is more legal because... Let's say that you buy a license, you buy a product that is a GPL license, or you just, you know, if you bought it, that's fine if you licensed it. But what if you didn't? Let's say that you have a developer that found the best, uh, you know, uh, JSON parser, and that JSON parser has a GPL license, or I don't know, you do uh, like NLP, right? There's a lot of libraries that have various types of licenses, right? And this violation may cost you quite a lot. It can be, you know, legal fees. Uh, it can be even a, you know, a public shaming thing if you took a library from a, uh, a university and decided to use it for commercial use, right? So, so that's kind of, you know, the balance between the legal uh, requirements and really identifying what are the third-party libraries that you have. Um, and last thing, go. I see that you want to say something. Well, I'm, but, I'm waiting for you to finish. Yeah, people so, want to hear you, not I, me. I won't finish, man. Like you need to, <laughs> you need to time it. So, <laughs> so uh, the last thing is that um, I almost forgot what I wanted to say. Well, you were going to uh, say the third thing. Yes, we talked about you know. We we spoke about the license third party oh, licensing. Yes, I found it. So the last thing is that you know people tend to think that open source means more secure. Right. And it doesn't necessarily mean that open source is more secure. Right. It means that if someone finds a vulnerability, he can decide if he wants to report on that or not. Who says open source is secure? I'm just curious who you talk to. Even if you talk about Linux. Right. right. People say that Linux is more secure than. Well, I, I just think that Linux is more complex. So the complexity makes it less of a less of a target for the simple hacker and makes it more sophisticated. So it's like security throw up security? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But I, I know that with open source, you know, you usually talk about uh, with, with security, uh, I think the best practice is that if you want to hide your security, you're probably doing something wrong. So you can share your security when you do open source, when you develop an open source uh, tool. But then it's prone to other attacks that will not be reported against you. So so there's there's this thing about open source where, like you said, you don't know what third, fourth, fifth, hundredth party has put into that 
open source code. You don't know any of the backdoors that exist there. You're taking it. It saves for a lot of companies. It's, it's a matter of it saves a lot of time and money, right? Instead of having to write a code, you can use a code. As a CISO, and a lot of times CISOs aren't in the DevOps space, right? They're, they're more like, hey, we've, we're launching an app. CISO, come, you know, review it. Let us know what we need to patch and fix, and we'll put it out there. But when you have an open source app, you have an app that's launched that's heavily reliant on open source, where do you start to address security there? I mean, how do you make sure that there isn't a backdoor by a white hat hacker, a black hat, who cares, by corporate espionage? There are organizations out there that just rewrite backdoors into open source so that they can you know, get access to data and information and sit on it for years. Yeah, so I think it uh, it, it ends up with uh, you know basic application security standardization, and I'll give you an example. Uh, you know there are things that you can do that are standard, and you know I'm not reinventing the wheel about all of the all of those things. It's like static analysis and dynamic testing. You can get that. It's it's there. There are additional things that you need to look at. Um, obviously. Uh, you have products that can look for third-party libraries and third-party vulnerabilities that uh, you know they already have a known database. But when you look at those products, and this is the, the common products, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Synopsys has one, the Black Dock, right? Uh, there's a, a, a White Source, and, and you know, obviously other products uh, look into this domain. But those tools check the third-party libraries at the build time, which means if there is a vulnerability that is more uh, dynamic or is, or is uh, derived from the fourth or fifth or sixth party, then you also need to look at something that, uh, that sandbox your scripts. Let's say sandbox and profile your scripts. And, and this is something that you can do only on the client side. You can't really do that when you build the software. So there's one thing that is a common thing today. It's a, you know, I'd say it's a quick win. Usually you just get the, the third party. It's called software composition analysis. You just get that tool. They do their work. It's awesome. And, and it has pretty good coverage. But then when you think about the third and fourth and fifth, uh, that's where we don't see that many products that can cover that. Um, I, I saw um, only one product that does it. Um, and it's interesting because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that I foresee to solve the problem, right? The additional thing is that I know that, uh, uh, you know, since you have open source tools, people can check in the code. And eventually when you download the code from the, from the public repo, you can download a malicious code. A malicious code. What you can do um, is let's assume that you already know that specific version is safe. So what you can do is uh, take that safe version and put it in a local repo and enforce that every time that someone wants to deploy code and let's say it has uh, no open source dependencies, the only place that, well, they, where they'll be able to get those dependencies would be from a local repo that you already approved. So the local repo has a copy of things that you know to be safe, according to your best knowledge. So, so I, I personally have a challenge with open source. And I'll tell you why. Beyond the obvious reasons of, you know, backdoors or, or, or vulnerabilities, and, and I think the stuff that you just highlighted, which you did an excellent job doing, I think the other problem with, with open source really is the fact that you never know who's really writing it. Right. You never know who really owns it and some vulnerabilities are like we say very hard to find it's very hard to vet open source right in a way we're supposed to trust the masses yeah and it's like uh, crowdsourcing eventually more people know like more contributors can uh, it's like uh, more contributors can... give it more reliability oh yes. look this had 5,000 contributors to it yeah, and there's but you don't know who those 5,000 people are. They could all be one. Right. They can be one. Uh, I don't know if there would be one. 
it's a possibility. But what I'm saying but is that this could be a group of people that have developed this code that are sitting in, different, in one part of the world, right? And there could be 5,000 different people or 2,000 different people, right, that, that have done this, or 200 people that have done 5,000 contributions to give this open source legitimacy. Right. But there's also um, a lot of people that have good intent when, you, when they contribute to open source. So if, let's say, that you, know, you checked in a code that sucks in, in security, I can... You know, eventually get your code and see. Well, you know, it doesn't make sense that you make this, uh, you know, bad security practices in the code, and I'll just fix it, right? Yes, someone needs to approve that branch <laughs> right. and make sure that you know whatever you checked in is is the right thing. Um, but eventually, there are more people that want to help than destroy. Or that's the assumption. That's that, the assumption that I live with. That's when you know when you make an assumption to make it an ass of you and me. Right, because because that's what when you yeah. assume that's what you're doing. Old thing someone once yeah. told me. It's, it's horrible. It's cheesy. It's like yeah. a dad joke. You know, but but, <laughs> but <laughs> I get to that because one of the greatest open source products out there today is WordPress. It's open source, mm -hmm. but every day I see seven to fifteen different vulnerabilities come out about people with different plugins, different things that happen there that impact the security of, of, of WordPress. And it's one of the main platforms for websites online. So let's, let's break that for a moment. Go. People say, uh, you know, I deployed a website over, the, over WordPress. So what most people, what most security people will tell to that person? Horrible idea. Horrible idea. But you can make WordPress secure. You need to harden the configurations. You can install, you know, the security plugins into that. You can put the proper logging. I'm you can, happy with that. You Keep can, going. yeah. You can, you can make WordPress secure. So everyone who says, "Hey, why do you do WordPress? It's not secure." Stop doing that, please. <laughs> it's not right. But what about but, the plugins? So, because the plugins yes. are the most dangerous part of WordPress. Because you're right. Everything you say about the shell of WordPress in your configurations is true. But WordPress relies heavy on plugins. And Correct. some of those plugins are corrupt and malware. To me, the plugin store in WordPress is no different than the Google Play Store on Android. It's exactly what I had in my mind. Yes, it's not different. Uh, but still, do you download any apps? Like if you would use a... I don't use Google Play. I, yeah. I'm an iPhone guy. Exactly. But if you used... Because <laughs> I, I know you. But if you used, um, I don't know, a Chromebook, would you download apps? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's right, why you that's why you buy it, right? You're buying it for we're we live in an app world. Right. Same thing with WordPress. Yes, you need to be diligent about your decisions and you need to look for feedbacks. Um and if you can um you know, if you take the plugins and they're open source, it's even better because now we can scan them and you can test them. And uh, you know, if you're not sure about that, get a pen testing company, get someone to test it with all of the, the configurations that you have to make sure that uh, that you're a bit, or to make sure that you took the right decision getting this plugin. I don't know if it's 100% secure, probably not. I know only one company that says that uh, they're 100% secure. <laughs> so as long as you're diligent enough about, about the activities you do to identify those third-party vulnerabilities, I think you're in a really good shape. You can, on the flip side, ignore that, and then you'll be in big trouble. When, when you think of it, I'm going to read you two headlines that I got this morning. All right. All right. They're all open source. Okay. Okay, so here's the first one. All right. Update now. WordPress hackers target easy WordPress SMTP plugin. So that's your SMTP plugin for your email on your WordPress. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there was an easy way. I haven't read the full story. I've seen the headline. I tried to read it this morning. Couldn't get to it. The other one. So this one cost Google, Facebook, and everyone millions and millions of dollars. And I'm surprised that it isn't headline news, but I think there's so much going on this in the news cycle right now that um, th this might be one of the best frauds I've seen. It says, this giant ad fraud scheme drained users' batteries and data by running hidden video ads in Android apps. So these guys created Android apps where they plugged in video ads 
and this was running in the background of your phone. So it was essentially letting the networks know someone was viewing the ads so they would get paid for it. But really no one was seeing any of the ads. And these were apps that were running in the Android store for months before anyone caught it. Mm -hmm. Open source, no user verification. Google relies on the will of the many to help regulate its store. But they just drain them of millions and millions of dollars. Right. But so l let me look at the, uh, the flip side here. How many of those, not happen, but how many of those you hear about? It's a lot, but well, it compared depends. to the, the amount of, of apps that you have on Google Play, it's nothing. Yes, probably the number is much bigger than that is communicated over the networks here, over the news. Uh, but eventually, yes. is People don't care. People, some people don't care. I agree with you, or don't know that they need to look at, right? Um, for people that listening to us that kind of think uh, are a bit more interested in security, I believe, um, yes, this is something that, that they should take a look at, right? So, I will tell you this. Open source has so many advantages on so many aspects. I think that when you look at the aspect of security, as a CISO, you're a CISO. I'm not a CISO. You are. Is open source a good thing for you or a bad thing for you? Does it make your job easier or harder? I think that I'm not the one that decides about open source, whether it should be leveraged or not. But if you I'm could. not trying to give you a, no, like no, no, a politically no, correct no, answer. No, no, you are. But I'm not. No, no, no yes, but you I'm are. Getting there. I'm getting there. So <laughs> I'm not the one that needs to decide whether we should have or shouldn't have open source. Said that, if a company decides that, that it wants to utilize open source tools, then I'm the one that will say, no problem. This is a list of the things that you need to do. Will it make my job more difficult? I don't know. It's like, you know, maybe it will be more difficult for me to do security for the additional code that they will develop instead of this open source tool. I don't know. But I know that there are certain practices that obviously I didn't invent that if you follow them, you'll be more secure rather than not doing them if you utilize open source. Does that answer your question? Almost. So let's say we live in a world, let's say we live in a dream world where a CISO is above the CTO and CIO and they report to the CISO, which in my estimates, we already start to see that trend kind of starting to flow in specific organizations where now the CISO reports directly to the CEO or reports directly to the CFO and he does not report to the CIO and CTO, but they actually report to him. There's two companies in America that are already doing that and I feel like once this is set in and there's a positive track record and, and, and that news starts to get out in the CEO field, we'll start to see more of it. But let's just say, um, but let's just say that, um, that, that, that does happen. And now you're, you're the CISO, you report directly to the CEO and you get to oversee all of it. Do you still allow your CIO and CTO to use open source tools? Yes or no? Yes. And the reason for that is because if we have any uh, productivity benefit, that's it's worth it. It's worth it. So it's a calculated risk you're willing to take. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I know we're getting short on time. And so I want to be sensitive of that because you and I went really long on our Hebrew episode, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. So one of the things I'm not, one of the things that we look at when it comes to open source is the dependability of the tools, right? And sometimes, you know, a tool that you use that could be a main component of your business is no longer being updated or could lack contributors because, you know, it was it was hot at one point and then it kind of became passe. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? There is a company, I forgot their name, um, that I heard about them, that they crowdsource the support for unsupported tools. Uh -huh. um, and I think this is genius uh, because... You can still enjoy the the benefit of the crowd to fix stuff for you, although you don't have the the legal commitment 
from the company to support it. But can you go through that until you figure out your way out of this product? Yes. Can you do it for two, three, five years? Probably. But will you be able to do that like over 20 years? I don't know. So for the for the midterm, I suppose that that would be okay to use something like that. Um, but uh, but probably not more than, not longer than that. Awesome. Well, being sensitive of time, I know that you and I can probably go on for another half hour on this easily. Possibly. Pretty sure we could. <laughs> um, I don't with, doubt. With the right alcohol, we can do that. I offered you wine before we started. You said no. Oh yeah. I had good wine for you too. Horrible. All right. So, um, thanks for listening. Uh, before you leave, though, just a few things. So, um, Vaultman on security and privacy on Facebook. That's uh, Nears. Um, personal message place. He makes really cool videos that are kind of put out every week or 10 days or so on some really cool topics. Um, he did one on smart houses that I think should be an internet sensation. I don't understand how it's not yet. Um, it's pretty cool because if you know where near lives now, you know how to break into his house. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, Vaultman on security and privacy on Facebook um, near who is a usual on our podcast, a voice we all love to hear from. Uh, thanks for being here, man. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. It's awesome to have you here. Uh, near and I do a lot of stuff in Hebrew. So if you want to listen in Hebrew, the episodes that we did before, uh, this one that will be posted on our iTunes page and on our YouTube page, um, and on our website at cyberhubengage.com, you can go there. Um, if you love our content, you love what we're doing, make sure you go to Patreon and show your support, uh, www.patreon.com forward slash cyberhubengage. Um, to support the podcast and everything we're doing, give a big shout out to our sponsor, Get Smart Eye, and um, we'll get that piece done here. Uh, very excited. Thanks for being here. You're watching and listening to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. What am I forgetting, Micah? Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. That's it. And YouTube. Yeah, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. More subscriber means more advertisers, means we can keep delivering. Make sure you tune in and catch our new podcast starting under Cyber Hub Engage called Goodbye Privacy. What? Ask Alexa about us. And ask Alexa about us. Ask Alexa about Cyber Hub Engage, even though that goes against every single moral fabric of my body of having an Alexa. But. I will say that for the sake of this and our advertisers, please ask Alexa about Cyber Hub Engage. I am selling out and I'm going to go jump off my balcony. All right, guys. Thanks for watching Cyber Hub Engage near Vaultman, Vaultman on security and privacy. We will be back with more. Thanks for listening. I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Get Smart Eye. That's get smart, I like your eye, E-Y-E dot com. It's a new security company that's focused on your privacy. How many of you guys have eyes around watching your screens, your phones, your tablets? No matter where you are, it can be your own office, an airport, a train station, a co-working space, and even a coffee shop, right? But there's some documents and some information that really needs to stay with, you know, away from prying eyes. That's where Get Smart Eye comes in. They're using the latest biometric technology to give you complete control over the documents you send and who sees them. Whether you're viewing them yourself or sending them for someone else to view them, the Get Smart Eye technology ensures that whoever's seeing it is the right person. And should someone who shouldn't see it grab a look at it, it gets the document to disappear and won't reopen it until it verifies the identity of the person you sent it to. So to get more information, Go to GetSmartEye.com forward slash James. Again, that's GetSmartEye.com forward slash James. Again, GetSmartEye.com forward slash James. James.